I, I go around um, with answers in Genesis around uh, Australia, and we, it's an, the largest apolo apologetics ministry in the world. And uh, my, my brother, who is CEO and founder of Answers in Genesis uh, over in America, um, one of the reasons that I love the ministry of Answers in Genesis isn't because of my brother. Um, although I support him and I love him dearly and I support him, uh, the reason I love Answers in Genesis ministry is because what that, the impact that it had in my life. You see, when we get apologetics, what is apologetics? Well, it's being able to give an answer, and we'll look at that in a second, um, for your faith and, and, and to give it a defence. So I was one of those Christians who loved the Lord but was nervous about evangelising and nervous about standing up for my faith because how could I defend it when I didn't know what was going on? So with the resources that AIG have, I got in and uh, listened to all the videos, read books, all of that sort of thing. And you know what? It changed my life from being an ineffective Christian to being a much more effective Christian. And now, am I scared of um, talking to people about the Lord? No, I love the opportunities. And uh, as it comes up, I'll never pass it up because I'm not scared anymore because I have the answers. And um, because the culture of today is, is showing people that uh, you can believe in... You, it, it's fact that it's millions of years and that evolution is fact. And, you know, it turns people off uh, the Lord. And I'll show you why as we go on. Thank you. Um, 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts honour Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defence uh, to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet you do it with gentleness and respect. You see, we've got to be able to give a defence for our faith. How do we do that? We need to study God's word and uh, uh, understand what's happening in our culture so we can defend what's happening in our culture when we talk to people. So next slide, thanks. Uh, apologetics, being able to give a defence. And that's what we're doing today, is we're talking about um, how can we defend our faith and, and all of that sort of thing. This is the Creation Museum over in Kentucky. This is the front entrance to the Creation Museum. It's, a, it's an amazing place. There's some people who have, in, in this congregation today, been there. And it gives you wonderful teaching on... Um, on creation and what God did in uh, the creation week and, and the attributes of God and all sorts of things. And uh, you can see there an aerial view. That was the original car park. Um, next one. Uh, you can see over on the right-hand side now that they've had to extend that car park. The reason for that is because of the ark. You see, at the ark, yep, at the ark uh, encounter, yep, you're going to hear a lot of yeps here probably about 75 yeps. Um, that's, the, that's the ark that's built in uh, Kentucky. Now you can see them sitting right at the, uh, underneath the boat there. There's a person standing under it, under it at the front there. It's 15 feet off the ground, so it gives you some perspective of how big the ark was. Uh, and that's actually the biblical measurements of the ark. And a cubit is measured from the tip of your finger to your elbow, roughly about 18 inches, 450 mil. Uh, that's the car park. You can see all the buses lined up down there. In, in the warmer months, they get between six and 8,000 people per day, um, which is just amazing when you think that 30% of those are non-churched. Those buses that come up, they're, they're not Christian tours. Uh, some of them are, but a lot of them aren't Christian tours. So they'll come to the ark in the, during the day, and then they'll be going to the casino at night. Um, but... Um, those people are seeing the truth of what's happening and, 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 and all of that, so it's fantastic. And people coming to faith in, in the Lord uh, all the time through this ministry. Yep. Uh, that's, a, that's standing out from the ark. They've got a lake in front of it. Yep. That's the back of the ark. You can see the buildings on the back of the ark there where there's stairs and lifts and all of that. To the right of the ark, um, to the right of the ark here, uh, there's an auditorium that, that's actually being opened uh, on Easter and it seats 2,500 people so that when people come to the ark uh, they can do speaking events there as well. And then here we've got a petting zoo 
This is a 1,500-seat uh, restaurant, and uh, it's one of the biggest restaurants in America, and the food's great. So uh, 1 Peter 3.15, as we saw, but be in your hearts, honour Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defence. Because when we can, I'm going to say it a few times today, when we can, we can go out and evangelise to the world and to our children. Yep. Yep. Okay, I want to show you some statistics. Um, the greatest generation, uh, what's called the greatest generation, was born before 1928. Yep. Uh, we got the baby boomers um, from... 1946 to 1964. I know it's a surprise to most of you, but I just fit into that. Um, Generation X, 1965 to 1980. Uh, Generation Y, the millennials, 1980s to 1990s. And Generation Z, yep. This is a, this is a graph. It was done in 2010, so it would actually probably be a little bit worse than this now, but the attendance at religious services by generation. Um, so this is saying that 56% of the greatest generation was, uh, was going to church. 44% of um, the silent generation, 32% of baby boomers, 20%, uh, 27% of Gen, um, Gen X, and the millennials, 18%. Do you, see, do you see a sad decline in numbers there? And do you see how rapidly that, that decline is happening? Yep. And then we look at views of homosexuality by generation. Percentage saying same-sex sexual relations are always wrong. The greatest generation, 78%. The silent generation, 70%. Baby boom is 56%. Gen X, 47 Millennials, 43 And that's done a number of years ago. It would be even worse now. Do you see the decline in the moral values of our culture? Yep. So, uh, 2 Corinthians 11.13. But I fear, lest someone, somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, we've got to be careful in this, in this culture, don't we, that we don't get corrupted, that we stand firm on the authority of Scripture. And uh, we need to do that. Yep. So, do we believe in millions of years or do we believe in the six days of creation? See, I believe it's an authority issue. What do I mean by an authority issue? Well, is it men's word or God's word? Are we going to believe men over God's word God who has always been there, who knows everything, who doesn't make mistakes, or are we going to believe man's word and try and put it into God's word? So when you come to um, the six days of creation, this is the only time, the only time that people always question how long a day is in the Old Testament. Do you know in the Old Testament, uh, the word day, yom, uh, is mentioned 2,300 times. But it's only in Genesis 1 that we question how long that day is. It's only Genesis 1 because uh, we're trying to fit millions of years into it because we're trying to put men's word into, humanist words into, God's word. So what, what does it really mean, uh, the, day, the word day in Genesis uh, 1? Well, it's all about context. Now, let's go back. It's all about context. Uh, you know, I could say something like this. In my father's day, the cars were not as good as they are today. But in, in my day, they improved. But last Wednesday, I took a car for a drive and it was awesome. Do you see? It's all about context. In my father's day, is meaning a period of time. Last Wednesday, when I say when I day the day, uh, a day last week, we know that in context, context I'm talking about a 24-hour day. So it's all about context when it comes into uh, reading anything that we read, isn't it? So let's let's look at why 
why we, in context, um, in Genesis 1, that they're 24 hours days. Because in Hebrew, when you have the word yom, and you have the word morning with it, in all the Hebrew lexingtons everywhere, uh, and Hebrew language, when you have the word morning, it means 24 hour day. When you had, have the word evening with the word yom, it means a 24 hour day. When you have numbers with the word yom, it means 24 hours days. There's no getting around that. That's the actual text. Oh, and, and in the Lexington, Hebrew Lexington and everything uh, confirm that. So why do we have so much problem in context in Genesis 1 uh, um, that it doesn't mean long ages? Well, see, you see, it's, it's in the context of what, what uh, is written in Genesis 1 is that, whoop, going a bit quick there now, in, in uh, Genesis 1, I'm sorry, my mouth is dry. Um, in, in the context of Genesis 1, it's 24 hour days. Um, so in context, in Genesis, we see that God has uh, put in there that uh, one day he's got numbers, he's got morning, he's got evening. You know what I think he's saying there? He's saying to you people who in the 19th, 20th uh, century, 21st century, Listen, you silly people. Listen, you silly people. I put morning, I put evening, and I put numbers. How much more can I say that it's a 24-hour day? I cannot say any more than it's a 24-hour day. And, and we want to try and fit man's word into God's word. It doesn't work. Yep. So, is there a problem for Christians believing in millions of years? Well... Let's, let's look at John 3.16. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever so believeth in six literal days will be saved. Is that right? Not right at all. Not right at all. Let's go to the real John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, we can be, we can be Christians, we can be saved... And we can believe uh, in evolution, right? And we can believe in millions of years. We can be saved. Uh, so we're not, saying, we're not saying that you can't be saved if, if you believe in, in millions of years. But there's a but. Yep. And there's a big but. There's a huge but here. And it's a problem that we have throughout many, many churches right across our world and especially the Western world, where, where pastors, elders, people in the churches have given up the authority of Scripture and put man's word millions of years into the front part of Genesis 1. Now, here's the problem with that. When you do that, you're teaching your children that the Bible isn't true, that you can't believe the first part of Genesis. You can't believe this part here. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Just believe in the rest of the Bible. Don't worry about that. Do you know what that... And, and this is consistent thinking for people who go down this track. If, if I was taught that, and I go, well, that part of the Bible is not true, men tell me, men tell me that the miracles in the Bible can't happen. Doctors tell me that people can't ra be raised from the dead, uh, that the miracles, um, Jonah in the, in the big fish for three days, that can't happen. You know, all these miracles through the Bible. And you know what? The only time you go up to a, to a pastor uh, in a church and say, do you believe in the, in the miracle of, of Jonah? Yes, I do. Why? Because it's in the Bible. Okay. Do you believe in the virgin birth? Yes. Why? Because it's in the Bible. Do you believe in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, of course I do. Why? Because it's in the Bible. Well, why don't you believe the first part of the Bible? Because it's written in there as well that Jesus created the world in 24 literal days, in six days. Do you know the only place that we get a seven-day week from is the God's Word? That's the only place where we get a seven-day week. 
a month is the cycle for the moon, a year, a cycle for the earth around the sun, um, a, a day is 24 hour days, the, the earth spinning, but the only place that we get seven days is from God's word in Genesis 1. And do you know, you know what? If it's millions of years, I want to be born on the day of rest because then I don't have to go to work. Um, okay, next slide. You see, in the fossil layers, in the fossil layers, we see all sorts of things with, with um, tumours. That, that, that fossil there has a tumour, a brain tumour. Next one. Uh, talking about how they found arthritis in dinosaur bones. Yep. Talking about um, brain tumours, cancer, arthritis, spoken bones. We see all of this in the fossil layers, in, in, in the fossils of dinosaurs. And then, and then we have our Christian leaders saying, uh, well, it's okay to believe in millions of years. Let me show you the next slide. So if we tell our children and uh, people around us that millions of years is happening, do you know what we're doing? We're putting death and suffering, disease, pain, everything, before Adam and Eve uh, rebelled in the garden. Do you know what that means? And, and it's really quite logical when you think about it. You know what it means? It means we're saying that God is the author of death and he has always used death and suffering for millions of years um, before, before Adam and Eve rebelled. Do you know what? If, if God is the author of death and it's always been that way, why do we need a gospel? Because he's the author of death. Why do we need the gospel? It, it counteracts everything that people believe uh, from then on because it makes, it makes uh, Jesus coming to the cross really not worth it because death and suffering have always been there. Um, we, we, we know from God's word that death came was a consequence of Adam's rebellion in the garden. Adam and Eve's rebellion in the garden and death came then and then we need Jesus to save us from our sin but we're teaching our children all of that in one or two generations it can lead to unbelief you see we, we show, show our children that don't believe, don't believe in Genesis just trust in Jesus don't believe in Genesis just trust in Jesus that's all you need to know and do you know what it's not all you need to know I know that Jesus and we all know that Jesus is central and, and is, is, uh, is what we all focus on because Jesus is at the cross and what he did for us on the cross. But when you say, don't think about that part of the Bible, just come in and come to Jesus and trust in Jesus. Do you know what they're getting at school? They're getting that taught that evolution, millions of years, is true history. And what do we do? Just come to Jesus and we'll tell you a Bible story. And, and talk about stories. We'll talk about that a little bit further as we get through. So what we need to be teaching our children is, you know, why there's sin and death and suffering in the world. And it's really easy to understand why there's death and suffering in the world when you understand that Adam rebelled in the garden with Eve. And as a consequence of that, sin and death are in the world. And we're all at fault because we are all uh, from Adam. And all our sin has caused that. So death and suffering is in the world, not because God originated it through millions of years, but because of our rebellion in the garden. Yep. So after the, um, after the rebellion in the garden, we go along about 2,000 years and we get to the flood. Now I can't cover all the apologetics that we normally do. I'm actually giving you a glimpse of some of the stuff that we do. Uh, so there's probably about four or five different bits of talk through this. I'm just jumping uh, through. Look at, look at this. You see people fleeing. You see the ground opening up and water spraying out. You know, uh, Matt showed us last week the little bathtub ark. The little bathtub ark. And, um, and how there's animals sticking out of the top of it and all of that. Do you know what? That's a Bible story and, and if we teach that to our children and then they go to school and they hear 
this is really fact over here, and science has proven the Bible wrong, which it hasn't. I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, we need to show them the truth, the truth of what happened in the flood. And the truth is that it was a catastrophic event, it was a supernatural event, and that God wiped out those peoples because they were wicked, wicked only all the time. So, next, next slide. So this is how we need to show the ark. Um, not one of those bathtub arcs. This is, then, then, the, then our children and people will see that, yes, all the, all the animals could fit on that. And I'm not talking about all the animals, different species. You know, um, Matt, Matt mentioned this last week. You get the wolf kind. And the wolf kind actually has all the genetic information to breed out into other dogs. So we're not talking about species, we're talking about kind. And when, when the Bible says kind in, in uh, Genesis 1 and even further on in, in Genesis 6 and 7, um, God's talking about the family part of it, that, that kind, not, not, not the species coming in underneath it as far as dogs splitting up and you've got... Uh, a poodle over here and you've got you know, different breeds over here. He's talking about the kind that has all the, all the genetic information to make that up. So you only needed two dogs. You only needed two rhinoceros. You only needed two elephants, um, etc., to fit on the ark. Yep. And there's a whole talk. There's, there's one whole talk in just that, that there. So if we, were, if we were saying, okay, well, there's a worldwide flood, not a local flood, a worldwide flood, what would we expect to find in the rock layers all over the earth? What would we expect to find? Well, we'd expect to find something like this. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And what do we find in the rock layers uh, everywhere, in the highest mountains, Mount Everest, all over the place? We find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. You know, isn't it great to be a Christian? Isn't it great that, that all these things confirm God's word? It's great. And, um, do you know, uh, people will say, well, how, how, did the, how did the water cover Mount Everest? Well, I don't believe Mount Everest was there at the beginning of the flood. Um, remember, God opened up the, water, the, the, the deep, and the waters of the deep came out. The volcanoes arose. The mountains were pushed up through that event over the ark and just post-ark um, flood. Uh, all those mountains came into, into play. So... Uh, we look at the Grand Canyon and we see, we see people say, well, that took millions of years with that Colorado River running through it. It took millions of years uh, to make that happen in the Grand Canyon. Well, you know what? We are really blessed. Uh, I don't normally say when a volcano blows up we're blessed, but we are blessed in this way. Let's have a look at the next slide. Mount St. Helens uh, blew up in 1980 and... Um, from there, a whole lot of things happened. And there's a whole talk on this. Uh, I'm just skipping through masses of talks here. Um, we've got Engineers Kenyon. That was formed uh, in just a small amount of time with a lot of mud flow, catastrophic events. Uh, and that's actually 1 40th of the size of the Grand Canyon. And it was formed in a very short period of time. Yep. And then we see these rock layers here. And this is rock layers that were, um, or sedimentary layers that were laid down in, in Mount St. Helens. And see how you've got the layers there. In other parts of the canyon, you've got, you've got like uh, 100 feet of different layers, thousands of layers, etc., happening. But this one here, I want to show you something here. These layers here, and then you've got the, the large sedimentary amount on top of those layers. And see how there's no erosion between those layers on the top because it all happened catastrophically in a very short period of time. The next slide, thanks. Here's in the Grand Canyon. And uh, the, one, the, the, the layer at the bottom there is exactly the same type of layer that we find in Mount St. Helens. And do you know what? They're saying that between that layer and the top layer, there's five to ten mil million years. Do you see any erosion happening between those two layers? Do you see that probably the top layer was laid down in a very quick amount of time on top of that because there's no erosion? Do you know, it all confirms what we're seeing in the Bible of Noah's flood. Yep. Um, here, 
is um, another part in the Grand Canyon, and there's supposed to be a space of 140 million years, uh, so the, so the um, uh, geologists tell us, between the, those two layers. But look at the, what's happening with those two layers. They've been bent. No, no erosion between the two layers. They've been laid down pretty much um, in a, at the same sort of time, in a quick period of time. But, and then the earth's been pushed up because there was a lot of pushing during, during the flood, a lot of pushing and moving around of the earth's surface. And that's been pushed up and there's no fractures. Why is that? Because it was all wet at the, at the time. And if it was millions of years, it would have been dry and it would have been fractures. So, you know, isn't it great to be a Christian how we can look around and see confirmation of God's word? Yep. Here's another one. This is in the Kaibab uh, Canyon, in the, in the Grand Canyon. And you can see the amount of pushing that was going on and moving uh, during the flood. And I don't know if you can see it, but where that green tree is, right, right against those layers there that have been moved around, again, no fractures, and look how much they've been moved, would have been wet when it was done, there's actually a man standing there. So that's, that's quite a big, massive um, push. Yep. Here's another talk that can go for hours, and I'm just doing a couple of seconds. I'm just giving you snippets. Um, radiometric dating, perhaps the most popular form of uniformitarian uh, dating. Uniformitarian dating means that, that the amount of uh, substance, like radioactivity, that leaves a rock has always been uniform. We see the amount coming out of it today. So from that, we assume. And we all know what it means when we say assume. We all know. We've all assumed things in our life and got it completely wrong, haven't we? Most of the time when we assume. And they're assuming that that is, is the same today as it was ever. But what, what would make things change? What would make things change uh, if there was a, a catastrophic event somewhere in history uh, that, that uh, put more radioactivity and, and uh, all of that sort of thing into these rocks? Well, maybe it was the flood, eh? No, I'll just go back. So we're going to read that. Radiometric dating, perhaps the most popular form of uniformitarian dating, was the com, uh, com, com, cultimate, um, now I've got my, my tongue tied up here, a uh, factor that led to the belief in billions of years for Earth history for the secular humanists. A radiometric uh, dating method requires a ra radioactive, an element that wants to break down into another element, material A, or called the parent element, into material B, the daughter element. For example, a radioact radioactive form of potassium, the parent, wants to break down into argon, the daughter. Yep. Any, any radi uh, radiometric dating model or other uniformitarian dating methods can and does have problems with their assumptions. All uniformitarian dating methods require assumptions for uh, ex ex extra extrapolating uh, present day processes back into the past. The assumptions uh, related to radiometric dating can be seen in these questions, initial amounts. Uh, was any parent amount added? Was any daughter amount added? Was any parent amount removed? Was any daughter amount removed? was the rate of decay, has the rate of decay changed? See, they take in none, none of those factors at all. And the flood would have changed a whole heap of things uh, in that time. So, next slide. Here we look at the same sort of dating, and, and we, there's heaps of these. I've only put in um, a fraction of them. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, volcanic eruption. Um, Mount Etna in Sicily in 122 BC when the rock was formed. We know it because of history. They've, um, they've dated those with radiometric dating and they've got 170 to 330 uh, million uh, thousand years, sorry. Uh, Mount Etna in Sicily in 1972 erupted 210,000 to 490,000 years. Mount St Helens we know erupted uh, in 1980 and again in 86, and up 
that's up to 2.8 million years. You see, when you take assumptions and, and you put it into things, most likely you're going to be wrong. So they put these assumptions in and they're getting all these wild dates. What they don't tell you is they only put the dates in that suits their long ages. Because why? Well, they need long ages for evolution in their minds to work. You see, here's what science is proving. Science has proved this, that we have a certain amount of information in our DNA. Um, and what's our DNA make? Uh, other humans. Um, and, and as we go on, what do we see? Kind after its kind, elephants after elephants, dogs after dogs, cats after cats. We see that. We have a certain amount of information that is, is in our DNA. So they say, okay, well, there's a mutation and uh, evolution works through mutation. What is mutation? What is a mutation? A mutation is a loss of information. A mutation only ever is a loss of information. And um, you, you see where animals can adapt. So they, they might, there's in caves where some of these fish or, or lobsters uh, don't have eyes, they can't see, they're blind, they're born that way. They've adapted into that area. That's not evolution, that's a loss of information from a mutation. And what is it still? It's still a lobster. Um, you know, there is nothing through science ever, ever, that has proven that information is added biologically to the information we already have. There is nothing in history ever in science that has proved that. Okay. So ob observational science and historical science. This is where we need to be really understanding and uh, we get really clouded here because we have great scientists, um, great scientists who, who have done some wonderful things. You know, ob observational science. Let me explain observational science. Observational science is basically uh, what Matt was saying last week. We test and we can retest and we can retest and we can see the results. So ob observational science, like a wing of a plane, we can test that and see that the air pressure above and below is different and causes lift and we can retest it and retest it. Medications, we can see what they do. We can retest it and retest it and retest it. That's science. Science is knowledge. And a lot of scientists say, Christians, especially um, six-day literal creationists, don't believe in science. Well, of course we believe in science. You know the MRI machine that we all know? Um, my brother's actually good friends with the guy that designed that, six-day creationists. There's heaps, of, all, crea all, all creationists love science. But here's the thing. Those people that uh, are doing observational science, then they step over the line into historical science. Now what's a historical science? Well, we look at a fossil here and I walk up and I go, look at that fossil. That was probably laid down in the flood about 4,000 years ago because that's my worldview because my worldview is coming from God's word. Okay, never give up your worldview from God's word if you're in an argument either. Never give up God's word. Um, so, um, a geologist who is an atheist or doesn't want to believe in God would come up and go, oh, there's a fossil. That was probably laid down millions and millions of years ago. Why? Because they need long ages because we can't see it happening uh, to, to get evolution to work. Do you know in the, in the layers and in the, in the fossils have never ever found anything that's in between you know, turning from a fish into a lizard or anything like that. There's never been anything found. You know what, we hear in the, we hear in the news, we found, we found this uh, missing link between this fish and this bird, and it's a bone, or two bones. Uh, but we never hear in three or four months' time when they've done more work on it, that it's actually the fish. And, and it's just the same as we see today. We never hear those things. We hear all the hype, but we never hear the actual truth underneath it. So we see these scientists who do observational science and tell us that historical science is fact, where they've used all these assumptions. And then we don't understand historical science, so we try to put it into God's word, because we don't want God's word to be proved wrong. 
So then we put it into God's word. And that's the mistake that pastors, colleges, uh, Bible colleges, seminaries, everywhere across the world are making. And do you know what it's causing? It's causing people not to trust God's word. And uh, if people only understood the difference between observational science and historical science, uh, we would be far more, far more um, proactive and doing a lot more uh, in the communities that we're in. Okay. So we have a biblical account, Adam and Eve, uh, and then they had sons and daughters. One of the biggest questions across the world is where did Cain get his wife? Well, it was one of his sisters. Oh, that's incest. No, it's not. What? Well, not then, because, you see, why can't we marry a close relative? Because we have, we have mistakes in our genes that could be the same. That's why we can't marry a close relative anymore. But back then, they didn't have those mistakes. It was only after the flood that, that, that were told not to marry a, a close relative because over those years, mistakes started to come into the genes. In evolution, we're supposed to be getting better. Uh, from creation, we're actually getting worse. And what do we see? More mistakes, more mistakes in our genes. So we can't marry a close relative anymore. So no, it wasn't incest. It was, it was marrying a close relative. Uh, then we come to Noah and his sons. So from there, uh, the world starts again. It's had a reset, technology, all sorts of things. And then we come to the Tower of Babel. Yep. So this was something that happened in uh, 2000. I think it was 2000, yeah, 2000. Uh, they did, a, they did some, a lot of research on the uh, genome uh, and the health uh, announced that they had put together a draft of the entire sequence of the human genome. And the researchers found this. Next page. Uh, Ununanimously declared there is only one race, the human race. Do you know what? We are all one race. We have different people groups. Where did they come from? We have different um, uh, shades of melanin in our skin. Where did that come from? Uh, but we are all one people group. Do you know what? When they say you can't marry your brother, uh, a, a relative, you can't marry a relative, do you know what? I have married a relative, just not a close one, because you are all my relatives. We all go back to Noah, and we all go back to Adam. You are all my relatives. Everybody in the world is my relative. And when they say we have different races, do you know what? You can't call me a racist because I don't believe there's different races. I believe we're all one people group. We are all special to God in the same way. So, uh, next slide. Here's, here's um, uh, melanin. So, you can see here the melanin coming up through the, the cells, and you can see the melanin here. Melanin gives us our skin colour. And um, next slide. This is a strand of melanin, and you can see a lot of melanin on this side, dark pigment, and, a, and not much on this side, light pigment, pigment. You see, this is me. And down here, that's someone with a darker shade of melanin. We are all the same colour, just some people... Um, some people have more melanin than others. Do you know when someone says, but you're, you're white, am I white? If I was this colour, would I be alive? I'd be asking Dave for, you know, heart things and mouth to mouth. Um, <laughs> so I'm not white. See, I'm not white. So we, uh, we, all we, we are all the same. We are all relatives, just that we have, some of us have more melanin than others. Next slide. So you see, this is predicting, this is showing Adam and Eve, actually, um, and we, we, we suspect that they would have been middle brown. Why, why middle brown, uh, middle shade? Why, why would they have been that? Well, because in one generation, in one generation, because they have a, a big A and little a in their genetics, a big B, a little B, and they both have those uh, types of uh, light melanin and dark melanin, and they can have anything in between. So in one generation, they could have had uh, a very pale sun 
and a very dark sun in just, in just one generation because they have all the genes. You see, in genes are, um, there's a whole big talk on genetics as well, but just another one. I'm going long, aren't I? Um, my wife and I have blue eyes. All my kids have blue eyes. You know why? Because blue eyes is the bottom of the gene pool. Um, brown eyes actually has the ability to get, do all the different colours in, in the genes. And Elise, what colour are your three kids' eyes? Brown, hazel, and? Ha yep. So they have different colours. Because, of, because Matt has brown eyes, their gene pool has got a strong mix of genes again. Next slide. So you can see here, you can see here someone with, someone with a big A, big, big B uh, will have a strong amount of melanin. Someone like me has a small amount of melanin. And then as we mix through different people groups, um, we can bring that genetic uh, material back into the family line. Okay, next slide. You see here, this is um, twins born in Burbingary in Australia in May 2006. One was a Jamaican mother and one was a German father. And one had light, the light genes for melanin and one had dark. And in one generation, look what happened, bang. So we, where, okay, yep. At the Tower of Babel, when, when God confused the languages, what would have happened? Well, all these people groups would have got split up and um, gone into different areas because they could no longer communicate. Um, and, and different genes went with those different people groups. Yep. Uh, yep, we talked about that. So what we do at Answers in Genesis is we talk about the seven C's. We talk about how we can defend our faith in creation and uh, what co corruption is and why there's sin and death and suffering in the world. And uh, w people don't know that they're sinners these days. They don't go to Sunday school like they used to do 40, 50 years ago. They don't know Jesus only as a swear word. Um, so we need to show people who Jesus is, but they, they need to understand why they're sinners. And how do we do that? Genesis. Um, so then we go on to the flood, uh, the catastrophe, and we talk about confusion, how, how all the people groups and the different languages in the world bring, them, bring people to uh, Jesus and then to the cross. And you know what? That's a perfect, that's a really good way of making people understand the history of the world, and um, let me just take a few seconds um, to show you something. You know, when we, when we teach our children, are we teaching them Bible, Bible stories? Are we teaching them Bible stories? Or, this, this map here is something, whoops, this map here is something we can get from Answers in Genesis. Starts at creation, comes down here, to the flood, and then you see the Tower of Babel, come on along here to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and you can see what was happening in history all through here. Do you know what that does? It brings it alive for our children that the Bible's history is true and how it all works. Are we teaching our children that the Bible's history is true, or are we letting our schools do it who are teaching them a totally different history that's built on assumptions that's anti-God? So what are we doing? So I, I just want to um, uh, put that out there that we need to be talk, teaching our children about what's necessary uh, to get them into the, the kingdom of God. Next one. If you, it, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't that uh, so important? We need to make people understand that. Now, if, we, if we're saved... We, we, we uh, stand on God's word, we have moral absolutes, don't we? Because of we're standing on God's word, we're, we're doing what God tells us. We have biblical marriage, man and woman. We have sanctity of life, no euthanasia. We have life begins at fertilisation, uh, no abortion. But look what happens when you have man's word, man's naturalism, no God, moral relativism. Uh, marriage can be anything you want it to be. Euthanasia, just killing people. And abortion, and we see now in abortion in America, they want to bring in infanticide, which is the baby being born, and then the mother says, oh, I don't want it, we'll abort, 
and they just make it comfortable, let it dehydrate and die. It's disgusting. But that's no worse, that's no worse than an abortion at fertilisation. It's all legal murder. Okay. So, as the Western society gives up God's, God's, God's uh, word and gives up uh, living for the Lord, they take on their own ideals. And look what it does. It collapses our morality in the Western world. And what do we see in the Western world? Our morality collapsing. And we see gay marriage, we see abortion more and more. We see all of that because we aren't, we aren't making an impact in the culture. And, and the culture um, is influencing uh, the people in, in, in the church. Next slide. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. We're almost to the end. Here's the problem. See this guy here? We, predict, we put him in a suit and tie for a reason. See, he's aiming at God's word, the foundations. Foundations meaning uh, our foundations in Genesis. What's in Genesis? Why, do, why, do, why is there sin in the world? Why is there death and suffering in the world? Genesis 1 to 11. Why, why do we wear clothes? And I'm glad you are. But why do you wear clothes? Genesis 1 to 11. Um, why, why do we get married? Genesis 1 to 11. You see, our foundation is in Genesis, and we have so many of our pastors and uh, people now shooting down here saying, don't believe in Genesis, um, it's okay, just trust in God. And um, we're taking pot shots at all this, we're not being effective. But the humanists know where to get us. If we get us with and bring evolution into the church, you know what they're doing? They're destroying our foundations, they're destroying our foundations for our children, and guess what our children will end up doing? walking away from the church. And we see it in droves. And it's because we're not teaching our children the foundation of God's word. And we need to start turning that around. Next slide. Here's the solution. We need to start telling everybody that our foundation is true and why the assumptions of men is not. And we need to be able to defend our faith. When we can defend our faith, we can have a go at the foundations of the humanists and we can be much more effective in doing that. So we need to stand on the authority of Scripture. And do you know, if there's something that you don't agree with in Scripture, here's what I say. If I don't agree with something in Scripture, I'm wrong. Because God's never wrong. He doesn't make mistakes. We need to stand on the authority of Scripture. We need to be, and I'm so glad that I'm in a church that stands on the authority of Scripture, that we have a pastor that stands on the authority of Scripture, and he's been going through Genesis. Aren't we blessed here at Newbeath? Um, you know, there's plenty of stuff. I didn't bring any today. I wasn't going to make it a, a, um, that type of thing. But there's heaps of resources that we have in our office. We have an Answers in Genesis bookshop in our office. This is the flood of evidence. This is answers to carbon dating, to anything to do with the flood. We have answers books. And we have some in here. Answers books that gives us answers. Do you know what? When you can defend your faith, you can evangelise to your children. You can train your children up a lot better and you can train and uh, evangelise to people out in the community. And that's what people we want to be doing. Um, let's be people who can defend our faith. Let's get out and read God's word. Let's get out and get the answers so that we can give people the answers that we can all defend our faith. Okay, let's end in prayer. Father, we just thank you uh, for your word and we thank you that we can stand on the, your authority. We know that you are never wrong. And we know and, and, uh, that uh, you are alive and looking over and watching us. And Father, I pray that we'll be people that uh, you'll be glad to see uh, being able to defend, defend our faith and defend you in this, in this culture. In Jesus' name, amen.